There we go. Okay, there we go. Hi, everybody. I'm Mike DiPaolo. I'm the service reliability engineer on Pulp. For those of you that don't know what a service reliability engineer is, it's kind of like a, a site reliability engineer, a programmer's approach to system administration. Um, however, whereas a uh, regular, uh, typical, commonly seen uh, site reliability engineers focus on one, their organization's use case, I'm an upstream developer or slash product developer. I I develop uh, the the tooling, the automation, the deploying methods for as many different use cases as possible, as many different different customer sites as possible. Um, so this means that I'm primarily involved with the Ansible installer and with the Kubernetes operator. This talk is going to be focused, as well as the, uh, the single container image. This talk is going to be focused on the Ansible installer, uh, a demonstration of what it's like to actually use it not just on our development environment uh, called Pulp Lift, but also, but as a, as a user would go about using it. And it's, it's this, the specific goal is to identify what the user experience is like, why it's not as easy to use and e easy to start to pick up as, as we would hope it to be, and to identify some areas to some ways in which it can be improved. Um, so, Let's start by going to the pulp installer doc section called uh, getting started. Um, so here's our docs. Oh, oh sorry, let me share mm. my screen. Yeah, your screen share is not working right now. Oh, I purposely turned it off while I, while I presented. Uh, cool. We can see it so, now. Yep. Here's the uh, getting started page on our on Pulp Installer, um, and we have an example playbook. And I'm going to do the well. Well, we basically have two example playbooks. One's in the uh, Git source tree. The other one is directly in our docs. And it's also this also and this entire this other example playbook that's listed in detail in the docs is also on the main uh, pulp website as well, basically. So I'm going to use this as the example. And you'll see there's basically four steps, as well as further customization um, uh, afterwards. But you know, bef so I'm going to go over these steps. But before they do that, we have to cover the prerequisites, actually. So you need a suitable version of Ansible. Ans with, uh, recently, Ansible changed uh how they uh how they ship ansible in terms of the ansible engine or core itself versus the modules the modules which enable ansible to talk to this configure missing parts of the system like system d or cron jobs etc uh so you're going to see high ansible version numbers like 4.8 but uh the ansible engine is the version we concern ourselves with you need ansible engine uh, 2.9 or later. Uh, as of my, as of two days ago, the the version range was 2.9 through 2.11. Now 2.12 just came out. Um, and you might be wondering, can I install? Can I just install this from my systems package manager? And fortunately, the answer is yes. I'm going to go to my favorite website for looking up uh, Linux Linux distros and what packages they have. It even covers some BSDs as well. I'm going to type in Ansible. And you'll see that for some of our most common use cases, Ansible is there. If you have a CentOS 8 uh, system with Ansible installed, you're good to go. And, and remember, right now we're concerned, not concerned with the system we're going to install Pulp on, but just like the developer laptop or the Ansible server that's going to reach out to to install a Pulp. Because that's how Ansible works. It's like a SSH client that tells the SSH server, it manages the SSH server, basically. Um, um, so Apple, CentOS 8 has Ansible 2.9, uh, great. Uh, CentOS 7 has Ansible 2.9 as well, all in Apple, great. Fedora has Ansible 2.9 also. Um, our friends in uh, Debian and Ubuntu, yeah, they have two, Ansible 2.10. Ubuntu 2004 is an LTS release. It has Ansible 2010s and OpenSUSE. 
yeah, they have Ansible 2.9 as well. So, you know, there's, if you were on a disk that was not supported, you could do a pip virtual inf, but fortunately we can just install Ansible. And usually this package name is sufficient. It's like the meta package with all the modules and stuff for 2.10 and later and for 2.9, it's, it's just, there's a, it's a monolithic package. I saved just time by pre-downloading these packages. Okay, great. So now that, uh, and, uh, now that Ansible is installed, we've basically satisfied uh, the prerequisites. Uh, the Ansible interpreter and all the modules it needs, like basically stuff written in Python that enables Ansible to talk to the system components is installed. Um, I need to open that, reopen that terminal. I go to my favorite directory. Uh, next, we have to install uh, Ansible. Uh, Pulp installer itself. And in the old days, there was no good way of doing this. Like you would basically have to like, well, put this way, for, Ansible has had Ansible Galaxy for a long time, but it's recently gotten more sophisticated. Like we can install multiple roles and any properly designed installers can consist of multiple roles. That's like, a role is like a class, for example, in you know, Java, for example. So I'll show you what it would look like if someone would look us up. Um, I'm going to Ansible Galaxy's website. I'm going to search for an pulp installer, and there we are. It shows you the latest release and tells you the same exact command we say there. Um, so we're going to so we've gone from step zero, which is install Ansible, or step one, which is install pulp installer. Um, it's handling dependencies, but it's only handling the uh, dependencies of collections. It installed uh, pulp installer to my home directory, and it installed its uh, dependency collections as well. It did not, however, install the dependency uh, role. So we just run that install the simple command. And that's step two, yeah. Oh, I forgot to hit enter, my bad. So I installed uh, this dependency role. This is, you know, because the installer is like in other programming la languages, it's because installers are in Ansible, which borrows paradigms of other programming languages, we want to reuse ex third party existing roles as much as possible. It just prevents us from duplicating code and enables us to get the most optimized implementation, et cetera. So that's why we have these dependencies. Um, some of these contain modules now as well. So like POSIX will contain modules for like doing stuff like SE Linux actually. Crypto contains things for like generating certificates. So, so far this is all very straightforward. We, you know, somebody might have a, an odd distro they have to install uh, Ansible in a typical way, but you know this has been straightforward without many significant variations in how it has to be done. But now we get into the part where we write a playbook, and you know that this playbook includes variables. I'm going to follow this literally, and well, until I start changing it. So at the point that you write your playbook is the point that you start specifying the variables you want. It's basically, uh, oh, sorry, not hit enter. I keep on not doing that. Yeah. It's basic. I'm going to paste this and then we'll talk about it. And so this playbook is, is supposed to be as simple as possible because, um, and we have done many things to make it as simple as possible. Like in the old day, we had a list of roles. Now we have a single meta role called pulp all services. Um, that depends on all the underlying roles that do the actual heavy lifting. Um, we have, up top, we have the variables. Uh, and 
we don't require that many variables mainly specified by the user. We spec require them to specify a secret key. So it's going to specify a random string. And content origin is very commonly changed. So we make people specify that because it's basically, hey, what's the actual URL people are going to access the server at? Uh, we're going to default it to the FQDN that has Angible season, but people may not want that and very frequently not want it to be FQDN. You could make this auto detected not specified in the playbook, but it's we think of that a best practice. And similarly here, we have a pulp default admin password. We also force them to specify. So there's three categories. Ultimately, there's three categories of variables. One are like user preferences. So uh, preferences for like how you want pulp to behave according to, you know, uh, according to, you know, Simply just like this is the way we prefer to use it. This is optimization, et cetera. So I'm going to go to the exams. This means that users, at the time that, that people are writing the playbook or writing a separate variables file, they are going to specify these variables. And I'm just going to add a simple preference one. I'm going to specify the number of workers, which usually you would set to like the number of CPU cores plus uh, one or two. Um, yep, and that's at the correct indentation level. So now I'm also going to, the next category is uh, specifying the version of the, of the plugins that you, that you want. Sorry, which plugins you want and, op and often the version. So I'm going to leave it this with this pulp container argo RPM, but actually I'll add one more simple one, pulp file. I think technically you don't have to specify these curly brackets anymore, but in the old versions of pulp you did. You had to have an empty JSON object. And uh, so, but you know, in a more advanced, uh, I won't I won't cover all the way, but there's basically you could specify the exact version of all these plugins. You also specify the branch of all these plugins. So if you're installing pulp at 16, you know you can use things like pulp rpm 3.16 or Specifically, like 3.16.1, um, but other plugins don't have easily matched version strings, and it would simply be like this. Oh, go back, back to what it was before, and then finally, you're going to have uh, you're going to have miscellaneous things that make pulp installer compatible with your environment. One uh, miscellaneous variable. So I'm going to assume that this machine does not have a functioning firewall. I'm going to pulp. I'm going to, nor do I want one to be installed. So I'm going to say pulp configure firewall none. But so this right here is an acceptable, you know, go path running pulp installer. If I were to just run the installer with this, I know it would succeed. but I'm going to demonstrate the fact that commonly users will specify these variables wrong. I'm going to do something that I know is not going to work. They pull up RPM, give me an incompatible version. It's going to be incompatible with, uh, you know, pulp core 3.16, which is what the installer is designed for, because this is pulp installer 3.16. So next, I'm going to run this playbook. Um, Principal playbook install.yaml dash u uh, pulp sorry, vagrant because this is actually long story short, I'm just using a vagrant to buy a simple virtual machine, but I could just create a virtual simple machine anyway. I I don't need to ask this question actually, uh, because I'm long story short, uh, ask become pass. I mean use this argument, ask become pass. Um I next specify the name of the server the or, or the IP address and I get that from here. And then private key is, oh, hold on, pavement. Change. So 
the private, this is this SSH private key file. So I think that's sufficient right there. And again, I know this is going to fail. That's on purpose because I'm just demonstrating what a common user experience would be like if they make one mistake and have to run the installer twice. Um, okay, I messed up the playbook. Let's take a look at what I did. Oh, I put this at the wrong indentation level. I actually didn't intend to do that, but but you know, this is this is an error message from the interpreter, not from like something that we really have control over. But it does show a common mistake that someone might make. Okay. Um, oh, whoops, I forgot to put the comma at the end because I'm specifying a, a, the, I ho the, the ho host by IP address or host name, not via an inventory file. So now Ansible is doing, is doing its magic. It's running against the... Uh, it's running against the, the virtual machine that has an estate server on it. You'll see as it's, it's and it, it, everything it does is broken down into tasks. And the tasks have names, names that we as uh, pulp and store developers specify. So there was that one pre-task in the playbook and it did that, installed Apple. And now it's, uh, uh, some tasks are intentionally skipped, that's basically like these tasks are only needed on other versions of the Linux distros, like CentOS 7 here. So now we're using our third party, and you notice these tasks begin with a role name, uh, except for the, pre, the one pre-task. So this pulp.pulp install.pulp database, well, that's one of our roles. And pulp database delegates most hefty lifting to this third party role called uh, Gearling Guys PostgreSQL. And it's doing a lot of really cool stuff. It's not only installing PostgreSQL, not only configuring it, but like, uh, you know, it's, well, it's, that's basically what this does. But next, it, uh, it does the, actually talks to the database, like, not just from a system perspective, from an application perspective, like it's ensuring that the user's accounts within PostgreSQL are present. When it says ensure, it basically means create it if it doesn't exist. If it does exist, I have nothing to do. It would report OK if it had nothing to do. Now it's uh, setting up Redis, you know, one of Pulp's other dependencies. And after that, it moves on to Pulp Common, and this is the majority of installing Pulp. Uh, like we have individual roles, things like Pulp API and Pulp Content and Pulp Worker, but 90% of what those things need are in Pulp Common, like actually doing a pip install. So because it's on CentOS 8, it installs the Python 3.8 module stream uh so you know which uh oh and in rel 8 is called not modules it's called not modularity it's called app streams um it's doing some you know intricate like system configuration stuff like creating the pulp user creating directories and ensuring that the, and whenever it creates a directory it ensures that the correct permissions and ownership it's actually uh, said, hey, there's SC Linux on the, in the input on the system, so I'm going to install that as SC Linux policies while I'm at it. It actually compiles SC Linux policies too, but that's but that compile SC Linux policies is not like a big compilation task though. It's just it's a quick one. And here's where we get to uh, our check that this isn't an we intentionally failed because we wanted to make sure that we didn't install an incompatible set of plugins. Worst case scenario, you could have like a functioning system and you upgrade one plugin, you break up the entire system. So this error message is not very clear, but it does say that it failed a check. Um, and in fact, the error message is even more unclear because it's by default with Ansible, although you can fix this, it does not like present new lines in this JSON output. You can see it's JSON at the end there. So we are going to just fix that and we're just gonna fix it, but I'm gonna specify mainly the uh, unsuitable version. But technically, we don't even need to specify the version. It's just, uh, we can just do the, the, the brackets. So, and users basically have no clear indication that they can just safely rerun the installer too. 
um, as an Ansible user, knowing that I'm one and knowing that this our roles are designed to be a dimitent, I know I can safely do that, but many people will not assume that. They think, oh no, my systems are broken instead. I have to destroy the VM. And we and we start we build a VM, you know. The beauty of Ansible is this idea you know, if if your roles are properly written, you can be a dimitent and this isn't a problem. So you notice that as it's running all these tasks, nothing's reporting changed. Actually, one slight thing reports changed, but but th those things reporting changed because we actually have a different set of plugins installed this time, or different versions. But the requirements.in is basically includes the plugin's uh, version string, a number or lack thereof. And the requirements in is part of the check process, uh, the pre-flight uh, via PIP tools. Fabrice and I did a lot of work on this. Thank you. Okay. So, right. Uh, Right now the installer is still running. It actually like delegates a bunch, actually made it further than it did before because the pre-flight actually stopped it from creating the virtual and installing packages via pip or or running the like the the optional role called pop RPM prerequisites. Pop RPM prerequisites exist because like pop RPM has extra C dependencies, for example, that are, you know, and those are RPM packages. We have a similar optional role for Galaxy and G. So it's running the check again. And this time I'm, I'm confident it will succeed. Yep, it did. So now it's installing Pulp Core itself and it's already done the check so it knows it can safely do this. Oh, I just realized I'm running low on time. Well, I was just, just about to say. Yeah, I'm gonna go to the uh, list of possible improvements to the installer process. But if I go back to the getting started guide, you know, running the playbook was the final step. But realistically, users are gonna be in a loop of modifying their playbook and running the playbook, modifying their variables and running the playbook. So I'm gonna now gonna focus on all the potential improvements that I've identified uh, like identified is one is a tool called one is a tool called OPSA. OPSA would eliminate steps one and two basic zero, one and two, or replace them with a single step. It could also make running step number three slightly easier as an alternative, but not much value. So, I mean, OPSA is a tool written by our sister project, uh, the Foreman, and it basically creates a CLI application from uh, from Ansible roles or Ans you know, from Ansible. So, when you install, if I were to say install Pulp, hypothetically, if there's Pulp OPSA, it would install the Ansible interpreter or roles, its depend their dependencies, for, uh, and it would also um, and note that our roles are a collect our package as a collection. And then it would also provide like a command line. However, as I explained in a in a in a meeting minutes a while ago, it wouldn't you know oh hold on, let me get these meeting minute notes. This is meeting minute notes May 2020. It would you know, the user experience would be like this. They'd run pulp installer or pulp OPSA, and then they'd specify in command line all these variables that they could otherwise, or a variables file. Either way, they'd still be responsible for the syntax and the correctness of all those variables. And they'd still get the same error messages if they fail. So 
OPSA does not eliminate the hard problem. It just eliminates the easy problems. So I didn't uh, pursue OPSA very much any further. It would be nice if we had like a simple, like, if we had type of, like an editor that verifies variables be, be, as you specify them, but we just, we just don't, I just don't know of any tool to do that yet. It's not, and it's not an OPSA. So the other idea is to do numerous, uh, you know, usability fixes and clarity issues. Uh, I use the term clarity is like a term from video games. Like the metaphor is like, if your character has been, been stunned by an evil mage, he should be appear frozen, like with ice crystals on him or appear in a crystal lattice or something. So uh, like, oh, well, I was not expecting that error, but either way, the, the clarity issues are things like that. It should be, uh, it should be like the the way the error messages are presented or the fact that like you can run the installer repeatedly there's no good indication they could do that um three is we could you know we, we could over another simple you know usability issue is that if you look at the example playbook like there's a workaround here that i could just solve with engineering but i haven't done engineering work yet uh, I really like to, there's a lot of things I've been trying to make the experience better, but I've been pulled onto uh, many uh, like needs for stakeholders over the last uh, year. So this could go away and then the example playbook would be simpler. And then, uh, so more helpful error messages. It is possible to override the error messages. Um, Fabricio has, um, mm -hmm. Mike, we're uh, kind of very much okay. at time. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I think that's just my presentation. I hope people get a sense of the fact that there are these suboptimal sub -optimal usability in the installer, but we have options to improve it. The installer does have all these great benefits. You know, you can run it against clusters, and that'll be in my next talk. It, it, it can be integrated in many people's, you know, deployments for the entire data center because it's Ansible, but these these issues are primarily use, an issue for people who just want to run install pop in one single system. Secondarily, people want to play it at scale and don't know Ansible perfectly yet. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. And if people do have questions, just we we have a lot of some time tomorrow for installer discussions because we expected that you know there there may be some things we need to discuss at length. So because we're kind of out of time, I would suggest making a note of anything and we will we'll tackle it tomorrow if that's okay. Okay, great. Yes, I'll I'll make I'll make plans for that. Thank you. I'm gonna stop the recording now.